All right, gang, welcome to Riser's Treasure Hunting Emporium's John Barry, Philadelphia Walking Tour. Now, John Barry was born in Wexford County in Ireland in 1745. His younger years were spent at sea, where he developed a maritime career, where he started out as a cabin boy and eventually worked his way up to being a sea captain. And uh, he eventually settled in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a decade prior to the Revolutionary War. Barry volunteered to fight for his new homeland, and during that war, he captured the first enemy warship, served alongside Washington's army at the Battle of Trent, helped supply the troops at Valley Forge, and fought the last battle of the American Revolution. After the war, Barry resumed his career on the sea, where he helped open trade with China. However, his civilian captain duties were interrupted when, in 1794, President George Washington named Barry as the first commissioned officer in the then new United States Navy. Barry remained the head of the United States Navy until his death in 1803. So, join us on our walking tour of historic Philadelphia while we visit some of the notable places to the life and times of John Barry. All right, gang, welcome, welcome, welcome to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And here you can see we are in front of Independence Hall and uh, located right here in the old city, Philadelphia. And uh, we're standing in front of it. And if you guys want to see what else is around me, we have the uh, Liberty Bell Center. Now, I don't know if you guys can make it out or not, but you can actually peek into the Liberty Bell right there well sorry for a shake cam but yeah zooming in why well, yeah it gets all kind of earthquakey but there's the liberty bell and behind us we have the independence visitor center and behind that the national constitution center but anyway gang we are here for a john barry historical walk of Philadelphia and places that are relevant to him in his life. It's odd to do a, a historical walk on land about a sea captain. But uh, anyway, but believe it or not, yes, our sea captain, John Barry, actually has something to do an episode here at Independence Hall. Now, Independence Hall, also known as the Old Pennsylvania State House, was a uh, built between 1732 to 1753 and it was originally a colonial legislature and then eventually later became the Pennsylvania State House. Now this was the meeting place of the uh, Second Continental Congress from 1775 to 1783. Uh, here, the Declaration of Independence was debated and adopted in 1776 and then the Constitutional Convention during the spring and summer of 1787. And uh, if you can just put that in perspective, it took four years for the Articles of Confederation to get completed, but it only took four months for the United States Constitution. But after the United States Constitution, it was up, up to each state for ratification. And uh, this same building here, the Pennsylvania State House or Independence Hall, why both things were going on. You had the, the convention going on downstairs and then eventually upstairs why you had the debate for the state of Pennsylvania and the ratification. Now, basically where we are going to jump in with regards to John Barry is during those meetings, those sessions of the Pennsylvania State Assembly for the ratification of the Constitution, why John Barry actually had fellow veterans of the Revolutionary War, friends, and even bosses. Uh, they, I mean, basically, if you are in Philadelphia at this point in time, you really, if you were in those inner circles, you knew everybody. And uh, Barry, by no means, since he was a veteran and pretty high up in the Continental Navy, he knew these people. I mean, he knew Washington, he knew Mifflin, he knew Fitzsimmons, he knew these guys. 
And not only that, but Barry had a vested interest in these meetings because he, he was kind of after getting paid for his services rendered being a captain in the Continental Navy. And he was hoping with this, the solidifying of the states and the reorganizing structuring of the government that he would eventually get paid. So yeah, he, he kind of had an interest in uh, what was going on inside this building. Now, this was also Franklin's last hurrah uh, with the state of Pennsylvania uh, ratifying the uh, Constitution. And uh, he was actually carried here for the sessions in a sedan chair. If you can imagine a chair with uh, two long poles and four guys carrying it, why, uh, that was a sedan chair. And that's actually going to kind of play a little part in our story that we've got about John Barry in this story. But yeah, so just don't remember that old guy, Franklin affirmed sedan chair. So anyway, and by the way, just a quick footnote, interesting point, why uh, that sedan chair was being carried by four inmates from Walnut Street Jail. So uh, whether, I don't know the exact details that they were promised a lighter sentence or anything like that, but yeah, four inmates from the Walnut Street Jail carried Franklin back and forth between the sessions. Now, during the ratification process, the sessions, you basically had two factions going on. You had the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Now, the Federalists, they were all about the big government, whereas the Anti-Federalists were about limited government. It's almost like the same conversations that we are having today. But the big parts of the Federalists uh, was Thomas Mifflin, George Clymer, and Thomas Fitzsimmons. And on the side of the Anti-Federalists, you had James McCalmont, Jacob Miley, and James Barr. And basically, the sessions for the state of Pennsylvania actually started almost, not, not quite right after the conclusion of the Constitutional Convention, but hurt near. And uh, we were getting into the latter part of 1787, uh, into September, and elections were coming. So they really wanted to take care of business and uh, be home in time for elections. Now, with the Anti-Federalists, they kind of had to pull, shall we say, tactics because they did not have the numbers in the sessions to control the floor of the assembly. So, we'll see one of their tactics here in a minute. But anyway, basically they got the votes in to approve the convention for the state of Pennsylvania for the ratification, and then they had to approve the dates and rules and et cetera for that convention. Now, on this particular day that we're talking about, recess was called, and it got to where the anti-federalists kind of realized that they could not control the vote, they couldn't really do anything, so they were going to resort to one of those tactics. So after recess at 4 o'clock, they did a roll call, and there were no anti-federalists present. And since there was no anti-federalists present, there was no quorum, hence no vote. It was their trump card. Anyway, so they sent the sergeant at arms from the assembly down to Chestnut on 6th Street to Major Boyd's boarding house. And uh, basically they, they were going to go and fetch the anti-federalists. Well, they refused. Weren't going to come and just basically held their ground. And basically the folks here at the assembly kind of got the idea that, wow, we cannot do anything without the numbers. And they were really trying to push for Pennsylvania to be the first state to ratify the United States Constitution, but yet yeah, this matter wasn't helping. So again, they recessed until nine o'clock the next morning. Now, John Barry, he was like a, he was in these sessions because, like I said, he had a vested interest. Now, something odd and peculiar happened that next morning. 
Instead of Barry coming directly here to Independence Hall or Old Pennsylvania State House, he went first down to the docks, just uh, several blocks down that way, and uh, he gathered up some of his boat's crew. Why, uh, he got some rogues, rapscallions, scallywags, and uh, basically brought them back here. Now, these guys were easily identifiable. These fellows that he brought with him were not genteel. They probably didn't have the best hygiene, and maybe perhaps their language was also maybe perhaps a little bit longer. But anyway, let's just say that they were highly noticeable in the crowd. Well, the session began at 9.30, and still no anti-federalists. And again, the sergeant at arms was sent to go retrieve them. And with what you guys can guess, why the anti-federalists again refused. Well, as soon as the sergeant at arms had announced that the anti-federalists were not coming, Barry and his men got up from the assembly there in the little gallery. Out the door they went and up that way, that way, to Chestnut and Six, up to Major Board's boarding house. Now, if you guys can imagine what that kind of looked like, this is really probably not an exaggeration of the people milling around. You probably had vendors, spectators, and whatnot. Why, uh, and now you got this mob of guys leaving the state house and going, going up the road. So, people followed. Reporters followed. So, up to Major Boyd's they went. And basically, Barry and his gang forced their way through the front door and uh, went upstairs to the room of McCalma and Miley. And uh, basically, they gave them an ultimatum. Either you guys can come back to the Pennsylvania State House on your own power or be carried there. Now, both McCalma and Miley were also veterans of that same war, and they were also frontiersmen, and uh, you know, kind of the rough and rugged guys. So uh, they again refused, even facing this mob, they refused. So then there was the order, take them. Well, thrashing, punching, just a melee of biting and punching and just general pandemonium ensued. There was, imagine there was hands all over the place there and yet it just was kind of just not the uh, most pleasant of scenes. Uh, even a reporter outside, once they got the two men outside, reported that their clothes were torn after much abuse and insult. And that was probably the understatement of the century. They were probably sweaty, bloodied, and etc. Now, they got the two men outside. They got them basically hoisted in the air, still struggling and punching and fighting and etc. You got this parade of people coming back down, back down 6th Street, and basically back here to the state house. And basically, if you can imagine that pandemonium, that throng of people carrying these two men back to the, the Independence Hall or the Pennsylvania State House here, why, uh, it, it had to been a sight. You know, the noise and the, the clamor and et cetera. Well, once they get inside the building, they take them upstairs and they throw them both over the railing of the assembly. Well, gang, they did a roll call and uh, had other assembly answer for them. And almost immediately, McCalma began to protest. You know, he was brought there by force by citizens he did not know. And uh, there was basically quips from other assemblymen. Uh, Fitzsimmons, who you do want to remember for later on today, Fitzsimmons actually said, you know, if a assemblyman had any kind of conduct, conduct like that, why that assembly should be marked down for disprobation. But uh, also too, uh, 
Brackenridge, who actually, is, you know, it, he's watching these proceedings go on. He says, you know, if they brought McCalma in a sedan chair, all we need to know that he is here. Doesn't matter how he got here. All that matters is that he is here. And basically, he was alluding to how Franklin was getting back and forth to all the uh, sessions. And uh, yeah, there's a gang there. It's a oh, yep, yep, got the peace sign going. And uh, hi, folks. Yes, you are in the street. Wow, what a cheery bunch. Anyway, gang. So. Um, McCalma still not thwarted in these proceedings why uh, he decided to pay the absentee fine and uh, Mifflin actually pointed out to him he could not pay the absentee fine because the clerk who was to receive it and do the receipt was an anti-federalist and not present. So one last effort McCalma bolted for the door but the sergeant of arms blocked it. Now remember, those rogues are still hanging around. I, I do believe if McCalmont got through that door, probably that mob would have killed him, but that's just speculation. That's not actually part of history, but anyway, gang. So long story short, too late, the resolution passed 44 to two, and there's no question whatsoever that who those two nay votes were why uh, the uh, vote was passed. And uh, the, the bells of Christ Church rang through the afternoon. And well, you know what, speaking of Christ Church, why uh, that's actually our next stop after Independence Hall. And uh, we'll get more into that later. But uh, just so you guys know, the state of Pennsylvania would be the second state to ratify the United States Constitution in December 12th of 1787. Now, if you guys bear with me, we are actually going to try and walk around to the statue of John Barry. And uh, here we go. And uh, basically, security now has changed after 9-11. It used to be where you could walk right through Independence, not through the building, but through the, the gates and whatnot of Independence Hall. But uh, since 9-11, all of that has changed. And this area has so much history to it. Oh my goodness. And uh, I live close enough to where we can actually make a day out of coming here. And uh, with, with so much history, if you're here just for a day and you're doing the quickie tour, there, there's really not enough time to get a up close and personal look at any one person in history because it's so grouped together. But uh, yeah, gang, that's why actually today we are just going to take a look at John Barry and uh, his life and etc. So we were walking down, uh, we are on Independence Mall East, otherwise known as Fifth Street, and uh, we're going to walk behind Independence Hall. And uh, back there, we'll be taking a look at the statue of John Barry, and which was also kind of peculiar. Why, w why would a Navy captain have a place of prominence for his statue here at Independence Hall, or the old Pennsylvania State House? All right, now here we are at the back end of the Pennsylvania State House.
or Independence Hall. And they're kind of hard to keep track of a building with two different names. I'm going to switch you back over to the uh, other picture just for a second, just so maybe you can get a different perspective. See, you got the the bell tower at the top, and then the clock. And unfortunately, got a couple trees. And there you go, gang. There is John Barry. And uh, right here behind Independence Hall. And uh, it doesn't have to be kind of peculiar. I wonder what he's pointing at. He's pointing over there. He's pointing at the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company. No, I don't know. Uh, anyway, gang. Well, like I said, our next stop is Christ Church. Christ Church is at 22 to 26 North 2nd Street. And uh, basically, we're going to be going three blocks down Chestnut Street East over and then uh, over to uh, 2nd Street and then two blocks up North. So anyway, gang, I'm going to spend a little bit of time with chat before we head on over there. And uh, we got Harry Potter walking through the, the park. <laughs> but uh, anyway, gang, I'm going to spend a little bit of time with chat and say hi to folks. And uh, I'm going to steal Sandy's phone because this app doesn't actually allow me to, s to see you guys. But uh, hey, North Jersey Detector, how are you? 606, how are you? Harry K, how are you? How are you? A-W-R. Hey, I heard you're under the weather. I hope you get better. Says North Jersey Detector. North Jersey Detector. You're sick too. Oh my goodness. It must be catching. <laughs> and uh, let's see who else we got. Dog stopped in, but um, he had to go to work. Oh, dog. Thanks for stopping in. But anyway, gang. Thank you, thank you, thank you all, one and all for tuning in. And uh, we'll be back through the course of the day. And uh, we'll probably be turning back on probably in about half an hour, an hour or so, once we get down to Christ Church, and we'll pick up from there. Anyway, gang, have a good day. We'll see you in a little bit. Bye now.